Section one of Colonel Chabert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bruce Peary. Colonel Chabert by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by Clara Bell and Ellen Marriage. Hello, there is that old box coat again this exclamation was made by a lawyer's clerk of the class called in french offices a gutter jumper a messenger in fact who at this moment was eating a piece of dry bread with a hearty appetite he pulled off a morsel of crumb to make into a bullet and fired it gleefully through the open pane of the window against which he was leaning the pellet well aimed rebounded almost as high as the window after hitting the hat of a stranger who was crossing the courtyard of a house in the rue vivienne where dwelt maitre derville attorney at law come simonin don't play tricks on people or i will turn you out of doors however poor a client may be he is still a man hang it all said the head clerk pausing in the addition of a bill of costs the lawyer's messenger is commonly as was simonet a lad of thirteen or fourteen who in every office is under the special jurisdiction of the managing clerk whose errands and billets doux keep him employed on his way to carry writs to the bailiffs and petitions to the courts he is akin to the street boy in his habits and to the pettifogger by fate the boy is almost always ruthless unbroken unmanageable a ribald rhymester impudent greedy and idle and yet almost all these clerklings have an old mother lodging on some fifth floor with whom they share their pittance of thirty or forty francs a month if he is a man why do you call him old boxcoat asked simonet with the air of a schoolboy who has caught out his master and he went on eating his bread and cheese leaning his shoulder against the window jam for he rested standing like a cab horse one of his legs raised and propped against the other on the toe of his shoe what trick can we play that cove said the third clerk whose name was godeschal in a low voice pausing in the middle of a discourse he was extemporizing in an appeal engrossed by the fourth clerk of which copies were being made by two neophytes from the provinces then he went on improvising but in his noble and beneficent wisdom his majesty louis the eighteenth write it at full length eh desroches the learned you as you engross it when he resumed the reins of government understood what did that old nincompoop ever understand the high mission to which he had been called by divine providence a note of admiration and six stops they are pious enough at the courts to let us put six and his first thought as is proved by the date of the order herein after designated was to repair the misfortunes caused by the terrible and sad disasters of the revolutionary times by restoring to his numerous and faithful adherents <sighs> numerous is flattering and ought to please the bench all their unsold estates whether within our realm or in conquered or acquired territory or in the endowments of public institutions for we are and proclaim ourselves competent to declare that this is the spirit and meaning of the famous truly loyal order given in stop said godeschal to the three copying clerks that rascally sentence brings me to the end of my page well he went on wetting the back fold of the sheet with his tongue so as to be able to fold back the page of thick stamped paper well if you want to play him a trick tell him that the master can only see his clients between two and three in the morning we shall see if he comes the old ruffian and godeschal took up the sentence he was dictating given in are you ready yes cried the three writers it all went in altogether the appeal the gossip and the conspiracy 
given in here daddy bucar what is the date of the order we must dot our i's and cross our t's by jingo it helps to fill the pages by jingo repeated one of the copying clerks before bucar the head clerk could reply what have you written by jingo cried godeschal looking at one of the novices with an expression at once stern and humorous why yes said desroches the fourth clerk leaning across his neighbor's copy he has written we must dot our i's and spelt it by gingo all the clerks shouted with laughter why monsieur Huet, you take by jingo for a law term and you say you come from mortagne exclaimed simonin scratch it cleanly out said the head clerk if the judge whose business it is to tax the bill were to see such things he would say you were laughing at the whole boiling you would hear of it from the chief come no more of this nonsense monsieur Huret. a norman ought not to write out an appeal without thought it is the shoulder arms of the law given in in asked godeschal tell me when bucar june eighteen fourteen replied the head clerk without looking up from his work a knock at the office door interrupted the circumlocutions of the prolix document five clerks with rows of hungry teeth bright mocking eyes and curly heads lifted their noses towards the door after crying all together in a singing tone come in bucar kept his face buried in a pile of papers brutille odds and ends in french law jargon and went on drawing out the bill of costs on which he was busy the office was a large room furnished with the traditional stool which is to be seen in all these dens of law quibbling the stove-pipe crossed the room diagonally to the chimney of a bricked-up fireplace on the marble chimney-piece were several chunks of bread triangles of brie cheese pork cutlets glasses bottles and the head clerk's cup of chocolate the smell of these dainties blended so completely with that of the immoderately overheated stove and the odor peculiar to offices and old papers that the trail of a fox would not have been perceptible the floor was covered with mud and snow brought in by the clerks near the window stood the desk with a revolving lid where the head clerk worked and against the back of it was the second clerk's table the second clerk was at this moment in court it was between eight and nine in the morning the only decoration of the office consisted in huge yellow posters announcing seizures of real estate sales settlements under trust final or interim judgments all the glory of a lawyer's office behind the head clerk was an enormous room of which each division was crammed with bundles of papers with an infinite number of tickets hanging from them at the ends of red tape which give a peculiar physiognomy to law papers the lower rows were filled with cardboard boxes yellow with use on which might be read the names of the more important clients whose cases were juicily stewing at this present time the dirty window panes admitted but little daylight indeed there are very few offices in paris where it is possible to write without lamplight before ten in the morning in the month of february for they are all left to very natural neglect every one comes and no one stays no one has any personal interest in a scene of mere routine neither the attorney nor the counsel nor the clerks trouble themselves about the appearance of a place which to the youths is a schoolroom to the clients a passage to the chief a laboratory the greasy furniture is handed down to successive owners with such scrupulous care that in some offices may still be seen boxes of remainders machines for twisting parchment gut and bags left by the prosecuting parties of the chatelet abbreviated to schley 
a court which under the old order of things represented the present court of first instance or county court so in this dark office thick with dust there was as in all its fellows something repulsive to the clients something which made it one of the most hideous monstrosities of paris nay were it not for the mouldy sacristies where prayers are weighed out and paid for like groceries and for the old clothes shops where flutter the rags that blight all the illusions of life by showing us the last end of all our festivities an attorney's office would be of all social marts the most loathsome but we might say the same of the gambling hell of the law court of the lottery office of the brothel but why in these places perhaps the drama being played in a man's soul makes him indifferent to accessories which would also account for the single-mindedness of great thinkers and men of great ambitions where is my penknife i am eating my breakfast you go and be hanged here is a blot on the copy silence gentlemen these various exclamations were uttered simultaneously at the moment when the old client shut the door with the sort of humility which disfigures the movements of a man down on his luck the stranger tried to smile but the muscles of his face relaxed as he vainly looked for some symptoms of amenity on the inexorably indifferent faces of the six clerks accustomed no doubt to gauge men he very politely addressed the gutter jumper hoping to get a civil answer from this boy of all work monsieur is your master at home the pert messenger made no reply but patted his ear with the fingers of his left hand as much as to say i am deaf what do you want sir asked godeschal swallowing as he spoke a mouthful of bread big enough to charge a four-pounder flourishing his knife and crossing his legs throwing up one foot in the air to the level of his eyes this is the fifth time i have called replied the victim i wish to speak to m derville on business yes but i can explain it to no one but m derville is in bed if you wish to consult him on some difficulty he does no serious work till midnight but if you will lay the case before us we could help you just as well as he can to the stranger was unmoved he looked timidly about him like a dog who has got into a strange kitchen and expects a kick by grace of their profession lawyers clerks have no fear of thieves they did not suspect the owner of the box-coat and left him to study the place where he looked in vain for a chair to sit on for he was evidently tired attorneys on principle do not have many chairs in their offices the inferior client being kept waiting on his feet goes away grumbling but then he does not waste time which as an old lawyer once said is not allowed for when the bill is taxed monsieur said the old man as i have already told you i cannot explain my business to any one but monsieur derville i will wait till he is up boucar had finished his bill he smelt the fragrance of his chocolate rose from his cane armchair went to the chimney-piece looked the old man from head to foot stared at his coat and made an indescribable grimace he probably reflected that whichever way his client might be wrung it would be impossible to squeeze out a centime so he put in a few brief words to rid the office of a bad customer it is the truth monsieur the chief only works at night if your business is important i recommend you to return at one in the morning the stranger looked at the head clerk with a bewildered expression and remained motionless for a moment 
the clerks accustomed to every change of countenance and the odd whimsicalities to which indecision or absence of mind gives rise in parties went on eating making as much noise with their jaws as horses over a manger and paying no further heed to the old man i will come again to-night said the stranger at length with the tenacious desire peculiar to the unfortunate to catch humanity at fault the only irony allowed to poverty is to drive justice and benevolence to unjust denials when a poor wretch has convicted society of falsehood he throws himself more eagerly on the mercy of god what do you think of that for a cracked pot said simonin without waiting till the old man had shut the door he looks as if he'd been buried and dug up again said a clerk he is some colonel who wants his arrears of pay said the head clerk no he is a retired concierge said godeschal i bet you he is a nobleman cried boucard i bet you he has been a porter retorted godeschal only porters are gifted by nature with shabby box-coats as worn and greasy and frayed as that old body's and did you see his trodden-down boots that let the water in and his stock which serves for a shirt he has slept in a dry arch he may be of noble birth and yet have pulled the door-latch cried desroches it has been known no boucar insisted in the midst of laughter i maintain that he was a brewer in seventeen eighty nine and a colonel in the time of the republic i bet theatre tickets round that he never was a soldier said godeschal done with you answered boucar monsieur monsieur shouted the little messenger opening the window what are you at now simonin asked boucar i am calling him that you may ask him whether he is a colonel or a porter he must know all the clerks laughed as to the old man he was already coming upstairs again what can we say to him cried godeschal leave it to me replied boucar the poor man came in nervously his eyes cast down perhaps not to betray how hungry he was by looking too greedily at the eatables monsieur said boucar will you have the kindness to leave your name so that monsieur derville may know chabert the colonel who was killed at Aylo? asked Ouray, who having so far said nothing was jealous of adding a jest to all the others the same monsieur replied the good man with antique simplicity and he went away phew dun brown poof oh ah broom the old rogue ting a ring ting sold again monsieur de roche you are going to the play without paying said Ouray to the fourth clerk giving him a slap on the shoulder that might have killed a rhinoceros there was a storm of catcalls cries and exclamations which all the onomatopoeia of the language would fail to represent which theatre shall we go to to the opera said the head clerk in the first place said godeschal i never mentioned which theatre i might if i chose take you to see madame saki madame saki is not the play what is a play replied godeschal first we must define the point of fact what did i bet gentlemen a play what is a play a spectacle what is a spectacle something to be seen but on that principle you would pay your bet by taking us to see the water run under the pont neuf cried simonin interrupting him 
to be seen for money godeschal added but a great many things are to be seen for money that are not plays the definition is defective said desroches but do listen to me you are talking nonsense my dear boy said Bucar. is courteous a play said godeschal no said the head clerk it is a collection of figures but it is a spectacle i bet you a hundred francs to a sou godeschal resumed that courteous waxworks forms such a show as might be called a play or theatre it contains a thing to be seen at various prices according to the place you choose to occupy and so on and so forth said simonin you mind i don't box your ears said godeschal the clerk shrugged his shoulders besides it is not proved that that old ape was not making game of us he said dropping his argument which was drowned in the laughter of the other clerks on my honor colonel chabert is really and truly dead his wife is married again to comte ferraud councillor of state madame ferraud is one of our clients come the case is remanded till to-morrow said Bucar. to work gentlemen the deuce is in it we get nothing done here finish copying that appeal it must be handed in before the sitting of the fourth chamber judgment is to be given to-day come on you go if he really were colonel chabert would not that impudent rascal simonin have felt the leather of his boot in the right place when he pretended to be deaf said desroches regarding this remark as more conclusive than godeschal's since nothing is settled said Bucard, let us all agree to go to the upper boxes of the francais and see talma in nero simonin may go to the pit and thereupon the head clerk sat down at his table and the others followed his example given in june eighteen hundred and fourteen in words said godeschal ready yes replied the two copying clerks and the engrosser whose pens forthwith began to creak over the stamped paper making as much noise in the office as a hundred cockchafers imprisoned by schoolboys in paper cages and we hope that my lords on the bench the extemporizing clerk went on stop i must read my sentence through again i do not understand it myself forty-six that must often happen and three forty-nines said Bucar. we hope godeschal began again after reading all through the document that my lords on the bench will not be less magnanimous than the august author of the decree and that they will do justice against the miserable claims of the acting committee of the chief board of the legion of honor by interpreting the law in the wide sense we have here set forth monsieur godeschal wouldn't you like a glass of water said the little messenger that imp of a boy said Bucar. here get on your double-soled shanks mare take this packet and spin off to the invalide here set forth godeschal went on and in the interest of madame la vicomtesse at full length de grand lieu what cried the chief are you thinking of drawing up an appeal in the case of vicomtesse de grand lieu against the legion of honor a case for the office to stand or fall by you are something like an ass have the goodness to put aside your copies and your notes you may keep all that for the case of navarin against the hospitals it is late i will draw up a little petition myself with the due allowance of in as much and go to the courts myself this scene is typical of the thousand delights which when we look back on our youth make us say those were good times end of section one section two of colonel chabert by honore de balzac translated by clara bell and ellen marriage this librivox recording is in the public domain 
read by bruce peary at about one in the morning colonel chabert self-styled knocked at the door of maitre d'elville attorney to the court of first instance in the department of the seine the porter told him that monsieur d'elville had not yet come in the old man said he had an appointment and was shown upstairs to the rooms occupied by the famous lawyer who notwithstanding his youth was considered to have one of the longest heads in paris having rung the distrustful applicant was not a little astonished at finding the head clerk busily arranging in a convenient order on his master's dining-room table the papers relating to the cases to be tried on the morrow the clerk not less astonished bowed to the colonel and begged him to take a seat which the client did on my word monsieur i thought you were joking yesterday when you named such an hour for an interview said the old man with the forced mirth of a ruined man who does his best to smile the clerks were joking but they were speaking the truth too replied the man going on with his work monsieur derville chooses this hour for studying his cases taking stock of their possibilities arranging how to conduct them deciding on the line of defence his prodigious intellect is freer at this hour the only time when he can have the silence and quiet needed for the conception of good ideas since he entered the profession you are the third person to come to him for a consultation at this midnight hour after coming in the chief will discuss each case read everything spend four or five hours perhaps over the business then he will ring for me and explain to me his intentions in the morning from ten to two he hears what his clients have to say then he spends the rest of his day in appointments in the evening he goes into society to keep up his connections so he has only the night for undermining his cases ransacking the arsenal of the code and laying his plan of battle he is determined never to lose a case he loves his art he will not undertake every case as his brethren do that is his life an exceptionally active one and he makes a great deal of money as he listened to this explanation the old man sat silent and his strange face assumed an expression so bereft of intelligence that the clerk after looking at him thought no more about him a few minutes later derville came in in evening dress his head clerk opened the door to him and went back to finish arranging the papers the young lawyer paused for a moment in amazement on seeing in the dim light the strange client who awaited him colonel chabert was as absolutely immovable as one of the wax figures in courteous's collection to which godeschal had proposed to treat his fellow clerks this quiescence would not have been a subject for astonishment if it had not completed the supernatural aspect of the man's whole person the old soldier was dry and lean his forehead intentionally hidden under a smoothly combed wig gave him a look of mystery his eyes seemed shrouded in a transparent film you would have compared them to dingy mother-of-pearl with a blue iridescence changing in the gleam of the wax lights his face pale livid and as thin as a knife if i may use such a vulgar expression was as the face of the dead round his neck was a tight black silk stock below the dark line of this rag the body was so completely hidden in shadow that a man of imagination might have supposed the old head was due to some chance play of light and shade or have taken it for a portrait by rembrandt without a frame the brim of the hat which covered the old man's brow cast a black line of shadow on the upper part of the face this grotesque effect though natural threw into relief by contrast the white furrows the cold wrinkles the colourless tone of the corpse-like countenance 
and the absence of all movement in the figure of all fire in the eye were in harmony with a certain look of melancholy madness and the deteriorating symptoms characteristic of senility giving the face an indescribably ill-starred look which no human words could render but an observer especially a lawyer could also have read in this stricken man the signs of deep sorrow the traces of grief which had worn into this face as drops of water from the sky falling on fine marble at last destroy its beauty a physician an author or a judge might have discerned a whole drama at the sight of its sublime horror while the least charm was its resemblance to the grotesques which artists amuse themselves by sketching on a corner of the lithographic stone while chatting with a friend on seeing the attorney the stranger started with the convulsive thrill that comes over a poet when a sudden noise rouses him from a fruitful reverie in silence and at night the old man hastily removed his hat and rose to bow to the young man the leather lining of his hat was doubtless very greasy his wig stuck to it without his noticing it and left his head bare showing his skull horribly disfigured by a scar beginning at the nape of the neck and ending over the right eye a prominent seam all across his head the sudden removal of the dirty wig which the poor man wore to hide this gash gave the two lawyers no inclination to laugh so horrible to behold was this riven skull the first idea suggested by the sight of this old wound was his intelligence must have escaped through that cut if this is not colonel chabert he is some thorough-going trooper thought Bucar. monsieur said derville to whom have i the honor of speaking to colonel chabert which he who was killed at a low replied the old man on hearing this strange speech the lawyer and his clerk glanced at each other as much as to say he is mad monsieur the colonel went on i wish to confide to you the secret of my position a thing worthy of note is the natural intrepidity of lawyers whether from the habit of receiving a great many persons or from the deep sense of the protection conferred on them by the law or from confidence in their missions they enter everywhere fearing nothing like priests and physicians derville signed to Bucar, who vanished during the day sir said the attorney i am not so miserly of my time but at night every minute is precious so be brief and concise go to the facts without digression i will ask for any explanations i may consider necessary speak having bid his strange client to be seated the young man sat down at the table but while he gave his attention to the deceased colonel he turned over the bundles of papers you know perhaps said the dead man that i commanded a cavalry regiment at Alo. i was of important service to the success of Murat's famous charge which decided the victory unhappily for me my death is a historical fact recorded in victoire et conquete where it is related in full detail we cut through three russian lines which at once closed up and formed again so that we had to repeat the movement back again at the moment when we were nearing the emperor after having scattered the russians i came against a squadron of the enemy's cavalry i rushed at the obstinate brutes two russian officers perfect giants attacked me both at once one of them gave me a cut across my head that crashed through everything 
even a black silk cap i wore next my head and cut deep into the skull i fell from my horse Morin came up to support me he rode over my body he and all his men fifteen hundred of them there might have been more my death was announced to the emperor who as a precaution for he was fond of me was the master wished to know if there were no hope of saving the man he had to thank for such a vigorous attack he sent two surgeons to identify me and bring me into hospital saying perhaps too carelessly for he was very busy go and see whether by any chance poor chabert is still alive these rascally sawbones who had just seen me lying under the hoofs of the horses of two regiments no doubt did not trouble themselves to feel my pulse and reported that i was quite dead the certificate of death was probably made out in accordance with the rules of military jurisprudence as he heard his visitor express himself with complete lucidity and relate a story so probable though so strange the young lawyer ceased fingering the papers rested his left elbow on the table and with his head on his hand looked steadily at the colonel do you know monsieur that i am lawyer to the countess ferraud he said interrupting the speaker colonel chabert's widow my wife yes monsieur therefore after a hundred fruitless attempts to interest lawyers who have all thought me mad i made up my mind to come to you i will tell you of my misfortunes afterwards for the present allow me to prove the facts explaining rather how things must have fallen out rather than how they did occur certain circumstances known i suppose to no one but the almighty compel me to speak of some things as hypothetical the wounds i had received must presumably have produced tetanus or have thrown me into a state analogous to that of a disease called i believe catalepsy otherwise how is it conceivable that i should have been stripped as is the custom in time of the war and thrown into the common grave by the men ordered to bury the dead allow me here to refer to a detail of which i could know nothing till after the event which after all i must speak of as my death at stuttgart in eighteen fourteen i met an old quartermaster of my regiment this dear fellow the only man who chose to recognize me and of whom i will tell you more later explained the marvel of my preservation by telling me that my horse was shot in the flank at the moment when i was wounded man and beast went down together like a monk cut out of card paper as i fell to the right or to the left i was no doubt covered by the body of my horse which protected me from being trampled to death or hit by a ball when i came to myself monsieur i was in a position and an atmosphere of which i could give you no idea if i talked till to-morrow the little air there was to breathe was foul i wanted to move and found no room i opened my eyes and saw nothing the most alarming circumstance was the lack of air and this enlightened me as to my situation i understood that no fresh air could penetrate to me and that i must die this thought took off the sense of intolerable pain which had aroused me there was a violent singing in my ears i heard or i thought i heard i will assert nothing groans from the world of dead among whom i was lying some nights i still think i hear those stifled moans 
though the remembrance of that time is very obscure and my memory very indistinct in spite of my impressions of far more acute suffering i was fated to go through and which have confused my ideas but there was something more awful than cries there was a silence such as i have never known elsewhere literally the silence of the grave at last by raising my hands and feeling the dead i discerned a vacant space between my head and the human carrion above i could thus measure the space granted by a chance of which i knew not the cause it would seem that thanks to the carelessness and the haste with which we had been pitched into the trench two dead bodies had leaned across and against each other forming an angle like that made by two cards when a child is building a card castle feeling about me at once for there was no time for play i happily felt an arm lying detached the arm of a hercules a stout bone to which i owed my rescue but for this unhoped for help i must have perished but with a fury you may imagine i began to work my way through the bodies which separated me from the layer of earth which had no doubt been thrown over us i say us as if there had been others living i worked with a will monsieur for here i am but to this day i do not know how i succeeded in getting through the pile of flesh which formed a barrier between me and life you will say i had three arms this crowbar which i used cleverly enough opened out a little air between the bodies i moved and i economized my breath at last i saw daylight but through snow at that moment i perceived that my head was cut open happily my blood or that of my comrades or perhaps the torn skin of my horse who knows had in coagulating formed a sort of natural plaster but in spite of it i fainted away when my head came into contact with the snow however the little warmth left in me melted the snow about me and when i recovered consciousness i found myself in the middle of a round hole where i stood shouting as long as i could but the sun was rising so i had very little chance of being heard was there any one in the fields yet i pulled myself up using my feet as a spring resting on one of the dead whose ribs were firm you may suppose that this was not the moment for saying respect courage in misfortune in short monsieur after enduring the anguish if the word is strong enough for my frenzy of seeing for a long time yes quite a long time those cursed germans flying from a voice they heard where they could see no one i was dug out by a woman who was brave or curious enough to come close to my head which must have looked as though it had sprouted from the ground like a mushroom the woman went to fetch her husband and between them they got me to their poor hovel it would seem that i must have again fallen into a catalepsy allow me to use the word to describe a state of which i have no idea but which from the account given by my hosts i suppose to have been the effect of that malady i remained for six months between life and death not speaking or if i spoke talking in delirium at last my hosts got me admitted to the hospital at heilsberg you will understand monsieur that i came out of the womb of the grave as naked as i came from my mother's so that six months afterwards when i remembered one fine morning that i had been colonel chabert and when on recovering my wits i tried to exact from my nurse rather more respect than she paid to any poor devil all my companions in the ward began to laugh 
luckily for me the surgeon out of professional pride had answered for my cure and was naturally interested in his patient when i told him coherently about my former life this good man named sparkmann signed a deposition drawn up in the legal form of his country giving an account of the miraculous way in which i had escaped from the trench dug for the dead the day and hour when i had been found by my benefactress and her husband the nature and exact spot of my injuries adding to these documents a description of my person well monsieur i have neither these important pieces of evidence nor the declaration i made before a notary at heilsberg with a view to establishing my identity from the day when i was turned out of that town by the events of the war i have wandered about like a vagabond begging my bread treated as a madman when i have told my story without ever having found or earned a sou to enable me to recover the deeds which would prove my statements and restore me to society my sufferings have often kept me for six months at a time in some little town where every care was taken of the invalid frenchman but where he was laughed at to his face as soon as he said he was colonel chabert for a long time that laughter those doubts used to put me into rages which did me harm and which even led to my being locked up at stuttgart as a madman and indeed as you may judge from my story there was ample reason for shutting a man up at the end of two years detention which i was compelled to submit to after hearing my keeper say a thousand times here is a poor man who thinks he is colonel chabert to people who would reply poor fellow i became convinced of the impossibility of my own adventure i grew melancholy resigned and quiet and gave up calling myself colonel chabert in order to get out of my prison and see france once more oh monsieur to see paris again was a delirium which i without finishing his sentence colonel chabert fell into a deep study which derville respected one fine day his visitor resumed one spring day they gave me the key of the fields as we say and ten thalers admitting that i talked quite sensibly on all subjects and no longer called myself colonel chabert on my honor at that time and even to this day sometimes i hate my name i wish i were not myself the sense of my rights kills me if my illness had but deprived me of all memory of my past life i could be happy i should have entered the service again under any name no matter what and should perhaps have been made field marshal in austria or russia who knows monsieur said the attorney you have upset all my ideas i feel as if i heard you in a dream pause for a moment i beg of you you are the only person said the colonel with a melancholy look who ever listened to me so patiently no lawyer has been willing to lend me ten napoleons to enable me to procure from germany the necessary documents to begin my lawsuit what lawsuit said the attorney who had forgotten his client's painful position in listening to the narrative of his past sufferings why oh, monsieur is not the comtesse ferraud my wife she has thirty thousand francs a year which belong to me and she will not give me a sou when i tell lawyers these things men of sense when i propose i a beggar to bring action against a count and countess when i a dead man bring up as against a certificate of death a certificate of marriage and registers of births they show me out either with the air of cold politeness which you all know how to assume to rid yourself of a hapless wretch or brutally like men who think they have to deal with a swindler or a madman it depends on their nature 
i have been buried under the dead but now i am buried under the living under papers under facts under the whole of society which wants to shove me underground again pray resume your narrative said derville pray resume it cried the hapless old man taking the young lawyer's hand that is the first polite word i have heard since the colonel wept gratitude choked his voice the appealing and unutterable eloquence that lies in the eyes in a gesture even in silence entirely convinced derville and touched him deeply listen monsieur said he i have this evening won three hundred francs at cards i may very well lay out half that sum in making a man happy i will begin the inquiries and researches necessary to obtain the documents of which you speak and until they arrive i will give you five francs a day if you are colonel chabert you will pardon the smallness of the loan as it is coming from a young man who has his fortune to make proceed the colonel as he called himself sat for a moment motionless and bewildered the depth of his woes had no doubt destroyed his powers of belief though he was eager in pursuit of his military distinction of his fortune of himself perhaps it was in obedience to the inexplicable feeling the latent germ in every man's heart to which we owe the experiments of alchemists the passion for glory the discoveries of astronomy and of physics everything which prompts man to expand his being by multiplying himself through deeds or ideas in his mind the ego was now but a secondary object just as the vanity of success or the pleasures of winning become dearer to the gambler than the object he has at stake the young lawyer's words were as a miracle to this man for ten years repudiated by his wife by justice by the whole social creation to find in a lawyer's office the ten gold pieces which had so long been refused him by so many people and in so many ways the colonel was like the lady who having been ill of a fever for fifteen years fancied she had some fresh complaint when she was cured there are joys in which we have ceased to believe they fall on us it is like a thunderbolt they burn us the poor man's gratitude was too great to find utterance to superficial observers he seemed cold but derville saw complete honesty under this amazement a swindler would have found his voice where was i said the colonel with the simplicity of a child or of a soldier for there is often something of the child in a true soldier and almost always something of the soldier in a child especially in france at stuttgart you were out of prison said derville you know my wife asked the colonel yes said derville with a bow what is she like still quite charming the old man held up his hand and seemed to be swallowing down some secret anguish with the grave and solemn resignation that is characteristic of men who have stood the ordeal of blood and fire on the battlefield monsieur said he with a sort of cheerfulness for he breathed again the poor colonel he had again risen from the grave he had just melted a covering of snow less easily thawed than that which had once before frozen his head and he drew a deep breath as if he had just escaped from a dungeon monsieur if i had been a handsome young fellow none of my misfortunes would have befallen me women believe in men when they flavor their speeches with the word love they hurry then they come they go they are everywhere at once 
they intrigue they assert facts they play the very devil for a man who takes their fancy but how could i interest a woman i had a face like a requiem i was dressed like a sans culotte i was more like an eskimo than a frenchman i who had formerly been considered one of the smartest of fops in seventeen ninety nine i chabert count of the empire well on the very day when i was turned out into the streets like a dog i met the quartermaster of whom i just now spoke this old soldier's name was boutin the poor devil and i made the queerest pair of broken-down hacks i ever set eyes on i met him out walking but though i recognized him he could not possibly guess who i was we went into a tavern together in there when i told him my name boutin's mouth opened from ear to ear in a roar of laughter like the bursting of a mortar that mirth monsieur was one of the keenest pangs i have known it told me without disguise how great were the changes in me i was then unrecognizable even to the humblest and most grateful of my former friends i had once saved boutin's life but it was only the repayment of a debt i owed him i need not tell you how he did me this service it was at ravenna in italy the house where boutin prevented my being stabbed was not extremely respectable at that time i was not a colonel but like boutin himself a common trooper happily there were certain details of this adventure which could be known only to us two and when i recalled them to his mind his incredulity diminished i then told him the story of my singular experiences although my eyes and my voice he told me were strangely altered although i had neither hair teeth nor eyebrows and was as colourless as an albino he at last recognized his colonel in the beggar after a thousand questions which i answered triumphantly he related his adventures they were not less extraordinary than my own he had lately come back from the frontiers of china which he had tried to cross after escaping from siberia he told me of the catastrophe of the russian campaign and of napoleon's first abdication that news was one of the things which caused me most anguish we were two curious derelicts having been rolled over the globe as pebbles are rolled by the ocean when storms bear them from shore to shore between us we had seen egypt syria spain russia holland germany italy and dalmatia england china tartary siberia the only thing wanting was that neither of us had been to america or the indies finally boutin who still was more locomotive than i undertook to go to paris as quickly as might be to inform my wife of the predicament in which i was i wrote a long letter full of details to madame chabert that monsieur was the fourth if i had had any relations perhaps nothing of all this might have happened but to be frank with you i am but a workhouse child a soldier whose sole fortune was his courage whose sole family is mankind at large whose country is france whose only protector is the almighty nay i am wrong i had a father the emperor ah if he were but here the dear man if he could see his chabert as he used to call me in the state in which i am now he would be in a rage what is to be done our sun is set and we are all out in the cold now after all political events might account for my wife's silence boutin set out he was a lucky fellow he had two bears admirably trained which brought him in a living i could not go with him the pain i suffered forbade my walking long stages i wept monsieur when we parted after i had gone as far as my state allowed in company with him and his bears 
at karlsruhe i had an attack of neuralgia in the head and lay for six weeks on straw in an inn i should never have ended if i were to tell you all the distresses of my life as a beggar moral suffering before which physical suffering pales nevertheless excites less pity because it is not seen i remember shedding tears as i stood in front of a fine house in strasbourg where once i had given an entertainment and where nothing was given me not even a piece of bread having agreed with boutin on the road i was to take i went to every post-office to ask if there were a letter or some money for me i arrived at paris without having found either what despair i had been forced to endure boutin must be dead i told myself and in fact the poor fellow was killed at waterloo i heard of his death later and by mere chance his errand to my wife had of course been fruitless at last i entered paris with the cossacks to me this was grief on grief on seeing the russians in france i quite forgot that i had no shoes on my feet nor money in my pocket yes monsieur my clothes were in tatters the evening before i reached paris i was obliged to bivouac in the woods of Cleille. the chill of the night air no doubt brought on an attack of some nameless complaint which seized me as i was crossing the faubourg saint martin i dropped almost senseless at the door of an ironmonger's shop when i recovered i was in a bed in the hotel Dieu there i stayed very contentedly for about a month i was then turned out i had no money but i was well and my feet were on the good stones of paris with what delight and haste did i make my way to the rue de mont blanc where my wife should be living in a house belonging to me bah the rue de mont blanc was now the rue de la chaussee d'antin i could not find my house it had been sold and pulled down speculators had built several houses over my gardens not knowing that my wife had married m ferraud i could obtain no information at last i went to the house of an old lawyer who had been in charge of my affairs this worthy man was dead after selling his connection to a younger man this gentleman informed me to my great surprise of the administration of my estate the settlement of the monies of my wife's marriage and the birth of her two children when i told him that i was colonel chabert he laughed so heartily that i left him without saying another word my detention at stuttgart had suggested possibilities of charenton and i determined to act with caution then monsieur knowing where my wife lived i went to her house my heart high with hope well said the colonel with a gesture of concentrated fury when i called under an assumed name i was not admitted and on the day when i used my own i was turned out of doors to see the countess come home from a ball or the play in the early morning i have sat whole nights through crouching close to the wall of her gateway my eyes pierced the depths of the carriage which flashed past me with the swiftness of lightning and i caught a glimpse of the woman who is my wife and no longer mine oh from that day i have lived for vengeance cried the old man in a hollow voice and suddenly standing up in front of derville she knows that i am alive since my return she has had two letters written with my own hand she loves me no more i i know not whether i love or hate her i long for her and curse her by turns to me she owes all her fortune all her happiness 
while she has not sent me the very smallest pittance sometimes i do not know what will become of me with these words the veteran dropped on to his chair again and remained motionless derville sat in silence studying his client it is a serious business he said at length mechanically even granting the genuineness of the documents to be procured from heilsberg it is not proved to me that we can at once win our case it must go before three tribunals in succession i must think such a matter over with a clear head it is quite exceptional oh said the colonel coldly with a haughty jerk of his head if i fail i can die but not alone the feeble old man had vanished the eyes were those of a man of energy lighted up with the spark of desire and revenge we must perhaps compromise said the lawyer compromise echoed colonel chabert am i dead or am i alive i hope monsieur the attorney went on that you will follow my advice your cause is mine you will soon perceive the interest i take in your situation almost unexampled in judicial records for the moment i will give you a letter to my notary who will pay to your order fifty francs every ten days it would be unbecoming for you to come here to receive alms if you are colonel chabert you ought to be at no man's mercy i shall record these advances as a loan you have estates to recover you are rich this delicate compassion brought tears to the old man's eyes derville rose hastily for it was perhaps not correct for a lawyer to show emotion he went into the adjoining room and came back with an unsealed letter which he gave to the colonel when the poor man held it in his hand he felt through the paper two gold pieces will you be good enough to describe the documents and tell me the name of the town and in what kingdom said the lawyer the colonel dictated the information and verified the spelling of the names of places then he took his hat in one hand looked at derville and held out the other a horny hand saying with much simplicity on my honor sir after the emperor you are the man to whom i shall owe most you are a splendid fellow the attorney clapped his hand into the colonel's saw him to the stairs and held a light for him Bucar, said derville to his head clerk i have just listened to a tale that may cost me five-and-twenty louis if i am robbed i shall not regret the money for i shall have seen the most consummate actor of the day when the colonel was in the street and close to a lamp he took the two twenty-franc pieces out of the letter and looked at them for a moment under the light it was the first gold he had seen for nine years i may smoke cigars he said to himself end of section two section three of colonel chabert by honore de balzac translated by clara bell and ellen marriage this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary about three months after this interview at night in derville's room the notary commissioned to advance the half-pay on derville's account to his eccentric client came to consult the attorney on a serious matter and began by begging him to refund the six hundred francs that the old soldier had received are you amusing yourself with pensioning the old army said the notary laughing a young man named crottat who had just bought up the office in which he had been head clerk his chief having fled in consequence of a disastrous bankruptcy 
i have to thank you my dear sir for reminding me of that affair replied derville my philanthropy will not carry me beyond twenty-five louis i have i fear already been the dupe of my patriotism as derville finished the sentence he saw on his desk the papers his head clerk had laid out for him his eye was struck by the appearance of the stamps long square and triangular in red and blue ink which distinguished a letter that had come through the prussian austrian bavarian and french post offices aha said he with a laugh here is the last act of the comedy now we shall see if i have been taken in he took up the letter and opened it but he could not read it it was written in german Bukhar, go yourself and have this letter translated and bring it back immediately said derville half opening his study door and giving the letter to the head clerk the notary at berlin to whom the lawyer had written informed him that the documents he had been requested to forward would arrive within a few days of this note announcing them they were he said all perfectly regular and duly witnessed and legally stamped to serve as evidence in law he also informed him that almost all the witnesses to the facts recorded under these affidavits were still to be found at a low in prussia and that the woman to whom m le comte chabert owed his life was still living in a suburb of halsberg this looks like business cried derville when bukhar had given him the substance of the letter but look here my boy he went on addressing the notary i shall want some information which ought to exist in your office was it not that old rascal Roguin? we will say that unfortunate that ill-used Roguin interrupted alexandre crottat with a laugh well was it not that ill-used man who has just carried off eight hundred thousand francs of his client's money and reduced several families to despair who effected the settlement of chabert's estate i fancy i have seen that in the documents in our case of ferro yes said crottat it was when i was third clerk i copied the papers and studied them thoroughly rose chapotel wife and widow of hyacinthe called chabert count of the empire grand officer of the legion of honor they had married without settlement thus they held all the property in common to the best of my recollections the personality was about six hundred thousand francs before his marriage colonel chabert had made a will in favor of the hospitals of paris by which he left them one quarter of the fortune he might possess at the time of his decease the state to take the other quarter the will was contested there was a forced sale and then a division for the attorneys went at a pace at the time of the settlement the monster who was then governing france handed over to the widow by special decree the portion bequeathed to the treasury so that comte chabert's personal fortune was no more than three hundred thousand francs consequently so it was old fellow said crottat you lawyers sometimes are very clear-headed though you are accused of false practices in pleading for one side or the other colonel chabert whose address was written at the bottom of the first receipt he had given the notary was lodging in the faubourg saint marceau rue de petit banquier with an old quartermaster of the imperial guard now a cow-keeper named verniot having reached the spot derville was obliged to go on foot in search of his client for his coachman declined to drive along an unpaved street where the ruts were rather too deep for cab wheels looking about him on all sides the lawyer at last discovered at the end of the street nearest to the boulevard between two walls built of bones and mud two shabby stone gate-posts much knocked about by carts in spite of two wooden stumps that served as blocks 
these posts supported a cross beam with a penthouse coping of tiles and on the beam in red letters were the words verniaux dairyman to the right of this inscription were some eggs to the left a cow all painted in white the gate was open and no doubt remained open all day beyond a good-sized yard there was a house facing the gate if indeed the name of house may be applied to one of the hovels built in the neighbourhood of paris which are like nothing else not even the most wretched dwellings in the country of which they have all the poverty without their poetry indeed in the midst of the fields even a hovel may have a certain grace derived from the pure air the verdure the open country a hill a serpentine road vineyards quickset hedges moss-grown thatch and rural implements but poverty in paris gains dignity only by horror though recently built this house seemed ready to fall into ruins none of its materials had found a legitimate use they had been collected from the various demolitions which are going on every day in paris on a shutter made of the boards of a shop sign derville read the words fancy goods the windows were all mismatched and grotesquely placed the ground floor which seemed to be the habitable part was on one side raised above the soil and on the other sunk in the rising ground between the gate and the house lay a puddle full of stable litter into which flowed the rain-water and house waste the back wall of this frail construction which seemed rather more solidly built than the rest supported a row of barred hutches where rabbits spread their numerous families to the right of the gate was the cow-house with a loft above for fodder it communicated with the house through the dairy to the left was a poultry-yard with a stable and pigsties the roofs finished like that of the house with rough deal boards nailed so as to overlap and shabbily thatched with rushes like most of the places where the elements of the huge meal daily devoured by paris are every day prepared the yard derville now entered showed traces of the hurry that comes of the necessity for being ready at a fixed hour the large pot-bellied tin cans in which milk is carried and the little pots for cream were flung pell-mell at the dairy door with their linen covered stoppers the rags that were used to clean them fluttered in the sunshine riddled with holes hanging to strings fastened to poles the placid horse of a breed known only to milkwomen had gone a few steps from the cart and was standing in front of the stable the door being shut a goat was munching the shoots of a starved and dusty vine that clung to the cracked yellow wall of the house a cat squatting on the cream jars was licking them over the fowls scared by derville's approach scuttered away screaming and the watchdog barked and the man who decided the victory at Aylo is to be found here said derville to himself as his eyes took in at a glance the general effect of the squalid scene the house had been left in charge of three little boys one who had climbed to the top of the cart loaded with hay was pitching stones into the chimney of a neighbouring house in the hope that they might fall into a saucepan another was trying to get a pig into a cart to hoist it by making the whole thing tilt when derville asked them if m chabert lived there neither of them replied but all three looked at him with a sort of bright stupidity if i may combine those two words derville repeated his questions but without success provoked by the saucy cunning of these three imps he abused them with the sort of pleasantry which young men think they have the right to address to little boys and they broke the silence with a hoarse laugh then derville was angry the colonel hearing him now came out of the little low room close to the dairy 
and stood on the threshold of his doorway with indescribable military coolness he had in his mouth a very finely coloured pipe a technical phrase to a smoker a humble short clay pipe of the kind called brûle he lifted the peak of a dreadfully greasy cloth cap saw derville and came straight across the midden to join his benefactor the sooner calling out in friendly tones to the boys silence in the ranks the children at once kept a respectful silence which showed the power the old soldier had over them why did you not write to me he said to derville go along by the cow-house there the path is paved there he exclaimed seeing the lawyer's hesitancy for he did not wish to wet his feet in the manure heap jumping from one dry spot to another derville reached the door by which the colonel had come out chabert seemed but ill-pleased at having to receive him in the bedroom he occupied and in fact derville found but one chair there the colonel's bed consisted of some trusses of straw over which his hostess had spread two or three of those old fragments of carpet picked up heaven knows where which milkwomen use to cover the seats of their carts the floor was simply the trodden earth the walls sweating saltpetre green with mould and full of cracks were so excessively damp that on the side where the colonel's bed was a reed mat had been nailed the famous box coat hung on a nail two pairs of old boots lay in a corner there was not a sign of linen on the worm-eaten table the bulletin de la grande armée reprinted by planchet lay open and seemed to be the colonel's reading his countenance was calm and serene in the midst of this squalor his visit to derville seemed to have altered his features the lawyer perceived in them traces of a happy feeling a particular gleam set there by hope does the smell of the pipe annoy you he said placing the dilapidated straw-bottomed chair for his lawyer but colonel you are dreadfully uncomfortable here the speech was wrung from derville by the distrust natural to lawyers and the deplorable experience which they derive early in life from the appalling and obscure tragedies at which they look on here said he to himself is a man who has of course spent my money in satisfying a trooper's three theological virtues play wine and women to be sure monsieur we are not distinguished for luxury here it is a camp lodging tempered by friendship but and the soldier shot a deep glance at the man of law i have done no one wrong i have never turned my back on anybody and i sleep in peace derville reflected that there would be some want of delicacy in asking his client to account for the sums of money he had advanced so he merely said but why would you not come to paris where you might have lived as cheaply as you do here but where you would have been better lodged why replied the colonel the good folks with whom i am living had taken me in and fed me gratis for a year how could i leave them just when i had a little money besides the father of those three pickles is an old egyptian an egyptian we give that name to the troopers who came back from the expedition into egypt of which i was one not merely are all who get back brothers vergniaud was in my regiment we have shared a draught of water in the desert and besides i have not yet finished teaching his brats to read he might have lodged you better for your money said derville bah said the colonel his children sleep on the straw as i do he and his wife have no better bed they are very poor you see they have taken a bigger business than they can manage but if i recover my fortune however it does very well 
colonel to-morrow or the next day i shall receive your papers from hausberg the woman who dug you out is still alive curse the money to think i haven't got any he cried flinging his pipe on the ground now a well-coloured pipe is to a smoker a precious possession but the impulse was so natural the emotion so generous that every smoker and the excise office itself would have pardoned this crime of treason to tobacco perhaps the angels may have picked up the pieces colonel it is an exceedingly complicated business said derville as they left the room to walk up and down in the sunshine to me said the soldier it appears exceedingly simple i was thought to be dead and here i am give me back my wife and my fortune give me the rank of general to which i have a right for i was made colonel of the imperial guard the day before the battle of Alo. things are not done so in the legal world said derville listen to me you are colonel chabert i am glad to think it but it has to be proved judicially to persons whose interest it will be to deny it hence your papers will be disputed that contention will give rise to ten or twelve preliminary inquiries every question will be sent under contradiction up to the supreme court and give rise to so many costly suits which will hang on for a long time however eagerly i may push them your opponents will demand an inquiry which we cannot refuse and which may necessitate the sending of a commission of investigation to prussia but even if we hope for the best supposing that justice should at once recognize you as colonel chabert can we know how the questions will be settled that will arise out of the very innocent bigamy committed by the comtesse ferraud in your case the point of law is unknown to the code and can only be decided as a point in equity as a jury decides in the delicate cases presented by the social eccentricities of some criminal prosecutions now you had no children by your marriage monsieur le comte ferraud has two the judges might pronounce against the marriage where the family ties are weakest to the confirmation of that where they are stronger since it was contracted in perfect good faith would you be in a very becoming moral position if you insisted at your age and in your present circumstances in resuming your rights over a woman who no longer loves you you will have both your wife and her husband against you two important persons who might influence the bench thus there are many elements which would prolong the case you will have time to grow old in the bitterest regrets and my fortune do you suppose you had a fine fortune had i not thirty thousand francs a year my dear colonel in seventeen ninety nine you made a will before your marriage leaving one quarter of your property to hospitals that is true well when you were reported dead it was necessary to make a valuation and have a sale to give this quarter away your wife was not particular about honesty as to the poor the valuation in which she no doubt took care not to include the ready money or jewellery or too much of the plate and in which the furniture would be estimated at two-thirds of its actual cost either to benefit her or to lighten the succession duty and also because a valuer can be held responsible for the declared value the valuation thus made stood at six hundred thousand francs your wife had a right of half for her share everything was sold and bought in by her she got something out of it all and the hospitals got their seventy-five thousand francs then as the remainder went to the state 
since you had made no mention of your wife in your will the emperor restored to your widow by decree the residue which would have reverted to the exchequer so now what can you claim three hundred thousand francs no more and minus the costs and you call that justice said the colonel in dismay why certainly a pretty kind of justice so it is my dear colonel you see that what you thought so easy is not so madame ferraud might even choose to keep the sum given to her by the emperor but she was not a widow the decree is utterly void i agree with you but every case can get a hearing listen to me i think that under these circumstances a compromise would be both for her and for you the best solution of the question you will gain by it a more considerable sum than you can prove a right to that would be to sell my wife with twenty four thousand francs a year you could find a woman who in the position in which you are would suit you better than your own wife and make you happier i propose going this very day to see the comtesse ferraud and sounding the ground but i would not take such a step without giving you due notice let us go together what just as you are said the lawyer no my dear colonel no you might lose your case on the spot can i possibly gain it on every count replied derville but my dear colonel chabert you overlook one thing i am not rich the price of my connection is not wholly paid up if the bench should allow you a maintenance that is to say a sum advanced on your prospects they will not do so till you have proved that you are comte chabert grand officer of the legion of honor to be sure i am a grand officer of the legion of honor i had forgotten that said he simply well until then derville went on will you not have to engage pleaders to have documents copied to keep the underlings of the law going and to support yourself the expenses of the preliminary inquiries will at a rough guess amount to ten or twelve thousand francs i have not so much to lend you i am crushed as it is by the enormous interest i have to pay on the money i borrowed to buy my business and you where can you find it large tears gathered in the poor veteran's faded eyes and rolled down his withered cheeks this outlook of difficulties discouraged him the social and the legal world weighed on his breast like a nightmare i will go to the foot of the vendome column he cried i will call out i am colonel chabert who rode through the russian square at eylau the statue he he will know me and you will find yourself in charentin at this terrible name the soldier's transports collapsed and will there be no hope for me at the ministry of war the war office said derville well go there but take a formal legal opinion with you nullifying the certificate of your death the government offices would be only too glad if they could annihilate the men of the empire the colonel stood for a while speechless motionless his eyes fixed but seeing nothing sunk in bottomless despair military justice is ready and swift it decides with turk-like finality and almost always rightly this was the only justice known to chabert as he saw the labyrinth of difficulties into which he must plunge and how much money would be required for the journey the poor old soldier was mortally hit in that power peculiar to man and called the will 
he thought it would be impossible to live as party to a lawsuit and it seemed a thousand times simpler to remain poor and a beggar or to enlist as a trooper if any regiment would pass him his physical and mental sufferings had already impaired his bodily health in some of the most important organs he was on the verge of one of those maladies for which medicine has no name and of which the seat is in some degree variable like the nervous system itself the part most frequently attacked of the whole human machine a malady which may be designated as the heart sickness of the unfortunate however serious this invisible but real disorder might already be it could still be cured by a happy issue but a fresh obstacle an unexpected incident would be enough to wreck this vigorous constitution to break the weakened springs and produce the hesitancy the aimless unfinished movements which physiologists know well in men undermined by grief derville detecting in his client the symptoms of extreme dejection said to him take courage the end of the business cannot fail to be in your favor only consider whether you can give me your whole confidence and blindly accept the result i may think best for your interests do what you will said chabert yes but you surrender yourself to me like a man marching to his death must i not be left to live without a position without a name is that endurable that is not my view of it said the lawyer we will try a friendly suit to annul both your death certificate and your marriage so as to put you in possession of your rights you may even by comte ferraud's intervention have your name replaced on the army list as general and no doubt you will get a pension well proceed then said chabert i put myself entirely in your hands i will send you a power of attorney to sign said derville good-bye keep up your courage if you want money rely on me chabert warmly wrung the lawyer's hand and remained standing with his back against the wall not having the energy to follow him excepting with his eyes like all men who know but little of legal matters he was frightened by this unforeseen struggle during their interview several times the figure of a man posted in the street had come forward from behind one of the gate pillars watching for derville to depart and he now accosted the lawyer he was an old man wearing a blue waistcoat and a white pleated kilt like a brewer's on his head was an otter-skin cap his face was tanned hollow-cheeked and wrinkled but ruddy on the cheekbones by hard work and exposure to the open air asking your pardon sir said he taking derville by the arm if i take the liberty of speaking to you but i fancied from the look of you that you were a friend of our generals and what then replied derville what concern have you with him but who are you said the cautious lawyer i am louis vergniaud he replied at once i have a few words to say to you so you are the man who has lodged comte chabert as i have found him asking your pardon sir he has the best room i would have given him mine if i had had but one i could have slept in the stable a man who has suffered as he has who teaches my kids to read a general an egyptian the first lieutenant i ever served under what do you think of us all he is best served i shared what i had with him unfortunately it is not much to boast of bread milk eggs well well it's neighbor's fare sir and he is heartily welcome but he has hurt our feelings he yes sir hurt our feelings to be plain with you 
i have taken a larger business than i can manage and he saw it well it worried him he must needs mind the horse i says to him really general bah says he i am not going to eat my head off doing nothing i learned to rub a horse down many a year ago i had some bills out for the purchase money of my dairy a fellow named guado do you know him sir but my good man i have not time to listen to your story only tell me how the colonel offended you he hurt our feelings sir as sure as my name is louis vergniaud and my wife cried about it he heard from our neighbors that we had not a sou to begin to meet the bills with the old soldier as he is he saved up all you gave him he watched for the bill to come in and he paid it such a trick while my wife and me we knew he had no tobacco poor old boy and went without oh now yes he has his cigar every morning i would sell my soul for it no we are hurt well so i wanted to ask you for he said you were a good sort to lend us a hundred crowns on the stock so that we may get him some clothes and furnish his room he thought he was getting us out of debt you see well it's just the other way the old man is running us into debt and hurt our feelings he ought not to have stolen a march on us like that and we his friends too on my word as an honest man as sure as my name is louis vergniaud i would sooner sell up and enlist than fail to pay you back your money derville looked at the dairyman and stepped back a few paces to glance at the house the yard the manure pool the cowhouse the rabbits the children on my honour i believe it is characteristic of virtue to have nothing to do with riches thought he all right you shall have your hundred crowns and more but i shall not give them to you the colonel will be rich enough to help and i will not deprive him of the pleasure and will that be soon why ah, yes ah dear god how glad my wife will be and the cowkeeper's tanned face seemed to expand now said derville to himself as he got into his cab again let us call on our opponent we must not show our hand but try to see hers and win the game at one stroke she must be frightened she is a woman now what frightens women most a woman is afraid of nothing but and he set to work to study the countess's position falling into one of those brown studies to which great politicians give themselves up when concocting their own plans and trying to guess the secrets of a hostile cabinet are not attorneys in a way statesmen in charge of private affairs but a brief survey of the situation in which the comte ferreau and his wife now found themselves is necessary for a comprehension of the lawyer's cleverness End of section three. Section four of Colonel Chabert by Honore de Balzac, translated by Clara Bell and Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Monsieur le Comte Ferreau was the only son of a former councillor in the old Parlement of Paris, who had emigrated during the Reign of Terror, and so, though he saved his head, lost his fortune he came back under the consulate and remained persistently faithful to the cause of louis the eighteenth in whose circle his father had moved before the revolution he thus was one of the party in the faubourg saint germain which nobly stood out against napoleon's blandishments 
the reputation for capacity gained by the young count then simply called monsieur ferraud made him the object of the emperor's advances for he was often as well pleased at his conquests among the aristocracy as at gaining a battle the count was promised the restitution of his title of such of his estates as had not been sold and he was shown in perspective a place in the ministry or as a senator the emperor fell at the time of comte chabert's death m ferraud was a young man of six-and-twenty without a fortune of pleasing appearance who had had his successes and whom the faubourg saint germain had adopted as doing it credit but madame la comtesse chabert had managed to turn her share of her husband's fortune to such good account that after eighteen months of widowhood she had about forty thousand francs a year her marriage to the young count was not regarded as news in the circles of the faubourg saint germain napoleon approving of this union which carried out his idea of fusion restored to madame chabert the money falling to the exchequer under her husband's will but napoleon's hopes were again disappointed madame ferraud was not only in love with her lover she had also been fascinated by the notion of getting into the haughty society which in spite of its humiliation was still predominant at the imperial court by this marriage all her vanities were as much gratified as her passions she was to become a real fine lady when the faubourg saint germain understood that the young count's marriage did not mean desertion its drawing-rooms were thrown open to his wife then came the restoration the count's political advancement was not rapid he understood the exigencies of the situation in which louis the eighteenth found himself he was one of the inner circle who waited till the gulf of revolution should be closed for this phrase of the king's at which the liberals laughed so heartily had a political sense the order quoted in the long lawyer's preamble at the beginning of this story had however put him in possession of two tracts of forest and of an estate which had considerably increased in value during its sequestration at the present moment though comte ferraud was a councillor of state and a director-general he regarded his position as merely the first step of his political career wholly occupied as he was by the anxieties of consuming ambition he had attached to himself as secretary a ruined attorney named delbecq a more than clever man versed in all the resources of the law to whom he left the conduct of his private affairs this shrewd practitioner had so well understood his position with the count as to be honest in his own interest he hoped to get some place by his master's influence and he made the count's fortune his first care his conduct so effectually gave the lie to his former life that he was regarded as a slandered man the countess with the tact and shrewdness of which most women have a share more or less understood the man's motives watched him quietly and managed him so well that she had made good use of him for the augmentation of her private fortune she had contrived to make delbecq believe that she ruled her husband and had promised to get him appointed president of an inferior court in some important provincial town if he devoted himself entirely to her interests the promise of a place not dependent on changes of ministry which would allow of his marrying advantageously and rising subsequently to a high political position by being chosen député made delbecq the countess's abject slave 
he had never allowed her to miss one of those favorable chances which the fluctuations of the bourse and the increased value of property afforded to clever financiers in paris during the first three years after the restoration he had trebled his protectress's capital and all the more easily because the countess had no scruples as to the means which might make her an enormous fortune as quickly as possible the emoluments derived by the count from the places he held she spent on the housekeeping so as to reinvest her dividends and delbecq lent himself to these calculations of avarice without trying to account for her motives people of that sort never trouble themselves about any secrets of which the discovery is not necessary to their own interests and indeed he naturally found the reason in the thirst for money which taints almost every parisian woman and as a fine fortune was needed to support the pretensions of comte ferraud the secretary sometimes fancied that he saw in the countess's greed a consequence of her devotion to a husband with whom she still was in love the countess buried the secrets of her conduct at the bottom of her heart there lay the secrets of life and death to her there lay the turning-point of this history at the beginning of the year eighteen eighteen the restoration was settled on an apparently immovable foundation its doctrines of government as understood by lofty minds seemed calculated to bring to france an era of renewed prosperity and parisian society changed its aspect madame la comtesse ferraud found that by chance she had achieved for love a marriage that had brought her fortune and gratified ambition still young and handsome madame ferraud played the part of a woman of fashion and lived in the atmosphere of the court rich herself with a rich husband who was cried up as one of the ablest men of the royalist party and as a friend of the king certain to be made minister she belonged to the aristocracy and shared its magnificence in the midst of this triumph she was attacked by a moral canker there are feelings which women guess in spite of the care men take to bury them on the first return of the king comte ferraud had begun to regret his marriage colonel chabert's widow had not been the means of allying him to anybody he was alone and unsupported in steering his way in a course full of shoals and beset by enemies also perhaps when he came to judge his wife coolly he may have discerned in her certain vices of education which made her unfit to second him in his schemes a speech he made apropos of talleyrand's marriage enlightened the countess to whom it proved that if he had still been a free man she would never have been madame ferraud what woman could forgive this repentance does it not include the germs of every insult every crime every form of repudiation but what a wound must it have left in the countess's heart supposing that she lived in the dread of her first husband's return she had known that he still lived and she had ignored him then during the time when she had heard no more of him she had chosen to believe that he had fallen at waterloo with the imperial eagle at the same time as boutin she resolved nevertheless to bind the count to her by the strongest of all ties by a chain of gold and vowed to be so rich that her fortune might make her second marriage dissoluble if by chance colonel chabert should ever reappear and he had reappeared and she could not explain to herself why the struggle she had dreaded had not already begun suffering sickness had perhaps delivered her from that man perhaps he was half mad 
and charenton might yet do her justice she had not chosen to take either delbecq or the police into her confidence for fear of putting herself in their power or of hastening the catastrophe there are in paris many women who like countess ferraud live with an unknown moral monster or on the brink of an abyss a callous forms over the spot that tortures them and they can still laugh and enjoy themselves there is something very strange in comte ferraud's position said derville to himself on emerging from his long reverie as his cab stopped at the door of the hotel ferraud in the rue de varennes how is it that he so rich as he is and such a favorite with the king is not yet a peer of france it may to be sure be true that the king as madame de grandlieu was telling me desires to keep up the value of the paris by not bestowing it right and left and after all the son of a councillor of the parlement is not a crillon nor a rohan a comte ferraud can only get into the upper chamber surreptitiously but if his marriage were annulled could he not get the dignity of some old peer who has only daughters transferred to himself to the king's great satisfaction at any rate this will be a good bogey to put forward and frighten the countess thought he as he went up the steps derville had without knowing it laid his finger on the hidden wound put his hand on the canker that consumed madame ferraud she received him in a pretty winter dining-room where she was at breakfast while playing with a monkey tethered by a chain to a little pole with climbing bars of iron the countess was in an elegant wrapper the curls of her hair carelessly pinned up escaped from a cap giving her an arch look she was fresh and smiling silver gilding and mother-of-pearl shone on the table and all about the room were rare plants growing in magnificent china jars as he saw colonel chabert's wife rich with his spoil in the lap of luxury and the height of fashion while he poor wretch was living with a poor dairyman among the beasts the lawyer said to himself the moral of all this is that a pretty woman will never acknowledge as her husband nor even as a lover a man in an old box-coat a tow wig and boots with holes in them a mischievous and bitter smile expressed the feelings half philosophical and half satirical which such a man was certain to experience a man well situated to know the truth of things in spite of the lies behind which most families in paris hide their mode of life good morning monsieur derville said she giving the monkey some coffee to drink madame said he a little sharply for the light tone in which she spoke jarred on him i have come to speak with you on a very serious matter i am so grieved monsieur le comte is away i madame am delighted it would be grievous if he could be present at our interview besides i am informed through monsieur delbecq that you like to manage your own business without troubling the count then i will send for delbecq said she he would be of no use to you clever as he is replied derville listen to me madame one word will be enough to make you grave colonel chabert is alive is it by telling me such nonsense as that that you think you can make me grave said she with a shout of laughter but she was suddenly quelled by the singular penetration of the fixed gaze which derville turned on her seeming to read to the bottom of her soul madame he said with cold and piercing solemnity you know not the extent of the danger that threatens you i need say nothing of the indisputable authenticity of the evidence 
nor of the fullness of proof which testifies to the identity of comte chabert i am not as you know the man to take up a bad cause if you resist our proceedings to show that the certificate of death was false you will lose that first case and that matter once settled we shall gain every point what then do you wish to discuss with me neither the colonel nor yourself nor need i allude to the briefs which clever advocates may draw up when armed with the curious facts of this case or the advantage they may derive from the letters you received from your first husband before your marriage to your second it is false she cried with the violence of a spoilt woman i never had a letter from comte chabert and if someone is pretending to be the colonel it is some swindler some returned convict like coignard perhaps it makes me shudder only to think of it can the colonel rise from the dead monsieur bonaparte sent an aide-de-camp to inquire for me on his death and to this day i draw the pension of three thousand francs granted to this widow by the government i have been perfectly in the right to turn away all the chaberts who have ever come as i shall all who may come happily we are alone madame we can tell lies at our ease said he coolly and finding it amusing to lash up the countess's rage so as to lead her to betray herself by tactics familiar to lawyers who are accustomed to keep cool when their opponents or their clients are in a passion well then we must fight it out thought he instantly hitting on a plan to entrap her and show her her weakness the proof that you received the first letter madame is that it contained some securities oh as to securities that it certainly did not then you received the letter said derville smiling you are caught madame in the first snare laid for you by an attorney and you fancy you could fight against justice the countess colored and then turned pale hiding her face in her hands then she shook off her shame and retorted with the natural impertinence of such women since you are the so-called chabert's attorney be so good as to madame said derville i am at this moment as much your lawyer as i am colonel chabert's do you suppose i want to lose so valuable a client as you are but you are not listening nay speak on monsieur said she graciously your fortune came to you from monsieur le comte chabert and you cast him off your fortune is immense and you leave him to beg an advocate can be very eloquent when a cause is eloquent in itself there are here circumstances which might turn public opinion strongly against you but monsieur said the comtesse provoked by the way in which derville turned and laid her on the gridiron even if i grant that your monsieur chabert is living the law will uphold my second marriage on account of the children and i shall get off with the restitution of two hundred and twenty five thousand francs to monsieur chabert it is impossible to foresee what view the bench may take of the question if on one side we have a mother and children on the other we have an old man crushed by sorrows made old by your refusals to know him where is he to find a wife can the judges contravene the law your marriage with colonel chabert has priority on its side and every legal right but if you appear under disgraceful colours you might have an unlooked-for adversary that madame is the danger against which i would warn you and who is he comte ferraud monsieur ferraud has too great an affection for me too much respect for the mother of his children 
do not talk of such absurd things interrupted derville to lawyers who are accustomed to read hearts to the bottom at this instant monsieur ferraud has not the slightest wish to annul your union and i am quite sure that he adores you but if someone were to tell him that his marriage is void that his wife will be called before the bar of public opinion as a criminal he would defend me monsieur no madame what reason could he have for deserting me monsieur that he would be free to marry the only daughter of a peer of france whose title would be conferred on him by patent from the king the countess turned pale a hit said derville to himself i have you on the hip the poor colonel's case is won besides madame he went on aloud he would feel all the less remorse because a man covered with glory a general count grand cross of the legion of honour is not such a bad alternative and if that man insisted on his wife's returning to him enough enough monsieur she exclaimed i will never have any lawyer but you what is to be done compromise said derville does he still love me she said well i do not think he can do otherwise the countess raised her head at these words a flash of hope shone in her eyes she thought perhaps that she could speculate on her first husband's affection to gain her cause by some feminine cunning i shall await your orders madame to know whether i am to report our proceedings to you or if you will come to my office to agree to the terms of a compromise said derville taking leave a week after derville had paid these two visits on a fine morning in june the husband and wife who had been separated by an almost supernatural chance started from the opposite ends of paris to meet in the office of the lawyer who was engaged by both the supplies liberally advanced by derville to colonel chabert had enabled him to dress as suited his position in life and the dead man arrived in a very decent cab he wore a wig suited to his face was dressed in blue cloth with white linen and wore under his waistcoat the broad red ribbon of the higher grade of the legion of honour in resuming the habits of wealth he had recovered his soldierly style he held himself up his face grave and mysterious looking reflected his happiness and all his hopes and seemed to have acquired youth and impasto to borrow a picturesque word from the painter's art he was no more like the chabert of the old box-coat than a cartwheel double sou is like a newly coined forty-franc piece the passer-by only to see him would have recognized at once one of the noble wrecks of our old army one of the heroic men on whom our national glory is reflected as a splinter of ice on which the sun shines seems to reflect every beam these veterans are at once a picture and a book when the count jumped out of his carriage to go into derville's office he did it as lightly as a young man hardly had his cab moved off when a smart brougham drove up splendid with coats of arms madame la comtesse ferraud stepped out in a dress which though simple was cleverly designed to show how youthful her figure was she wore a pretty drawn bonnet lined with pink which framed her face to perfection softening its outlines and making it look younger if the clients were rejuvenescent the office was unaltered and presented the same picture as that described at the beginning of this story simonin was eating his breakfast his shoulder leaning against the window which was then open 
and he was staring up at the blue sky in the opening of the courtyard enclosed by four gloomy houses aha cried the little clerk who will bet an evening at the play that colonel chabert is a general and wears a red ribbon the chief is a great magician said godeschal then there is no trick to play on him this time asked desroches his wife has taken that in hand the comtesse ferraud said Boucard. what next said godeschal is comtesse ferraud required to belong to two men here she is answered simonin so you are not deaf you young rogue said chabert taking the gutter jumper by the ear and twisting it to the delight of the other clerks who began to laugh looking at the colonel with the curious attention due to so singular a personage comte chabert was in derville's private room at the moment when his wife came in by the door of the office i say boucard there is going to be a queer scene in the chief's room there is a woman who can spend her days alternately the odd with comte ferraud and the even with comte chabert and in leap year said godeschal they must settle the count between them silence gentlemen you can be heard said boucard severely i never was in an office where there was so much jesting as there is here over the clients derville had made the colonel retire to the bedroom when the countess was admitted madame he said not knowing whether it would be agreeable to you to meet m le comte chabert i have placed you apart if however you should wish it it is an attention for which i am obliged to you i have drawn up the memorandum of an agreement of which you and m chabert can discuss the conditions here and now i will go alternately to him and to you and explain your views respectively let me see monsieur said the countess impatiently derville read aloud between the undersigned m hyacinthe chabert count marichal de comte and grand officer of the legion of honor living in paris rue du petit banquier on the one part and madame rose chapotel wife of the aforesaid monsieur le comte chabert nay pass over the preliminaries said she come to the conditions madame said the lawyer the preamble briefly sets forth the position in which you stand to each other then by the first clause you acknowledge in the presence of three witnesses of whom two shall be notaries and one the dairyman with whom your husband has been lodging to all of whom your secret is known and who will be absolutely silent you acknowledge i say that the individual designated in the documents subjoined to the deed and whose identity is to be further proved by an act of recognition prepared by your notary alexandre Corta, is your first husband comte chabert by the second clause comte chabert to secure your happiness will undertake to assert his rights only under certain circumstances set forth in the deed and these said derville in a parenthesis are none other than a failure to carry out the conditions of this secret agreement m chabert on his part agrees to accept judgment on a friendly suit by which his certificate of death shall be annulled and his marriage dissolved that will not suit me in the least said the countess with surprise i will be a party to no suit you know why by the third clause derville went on with imperturbable coolness you pledge yourself to secure to hyacinthe comte chabert an income of twenty-four thousand francs on government stock held in his name to revert to you at his death but it is much too dear exclaimed the countess can you compromise the matter cheaper possibly but what do you want madame i want 
i will not have a lawsuit i want you want him to remain dead said derville interrupting her hastily monsieur said the countess if twenty-four thousand francs a year are necessary we will go to law yes we will go to law said the colonel in a deep voice as he opened the door and stood before his wife with one hand in his waistcoat and the other hanging by his side an attitude to which the recollection of his adventure gave horrible significance it is he said the countess to herself too dear the old soldier exclaimed i have given you near on a million and you are cheapening my misfortunes very well now i will have you you and your fortune our goods are in common our marriage is not dissolved but monsieur is not colonel chabert cried the countess in feigned amazement indeed said the old man in a tone of intense irony do you want proofs i found you in the palais royal the countess turned pale seeing her grow white under her rouge the old soldier paused touched by the acute suffering he was inflicting on the woman he had once so ardently loved but she shot such a venomous glance at him that he abruptly went on you were with la allow me monsieur derville said the countess to the lawyer you must give me leave to retire i did not come here to listen to such dreadful things she rose and went out derville rushed after her but the countess had taken wings and seemed to have flown from the place on returning to his private room he found the colonel in a towering rage striding up and down in those days a man took his wife where he chose said he but i was foolish and chose badly i trusted to appearances she has no heart well colonel was i not right to beg you not to come i am now positive of your identity when you came in the countess gave a little start of which the meaning was unequivocal but you have lost your chances your wife knows that you are unrecognizable i will kill her madness you will be caught and executed like any common wretch besides you might miss that would be unpardonable a man must not miss his shot when he wants to kill his wife let me set things straight you are only a big child go now take care of yourself she is capable of setting some trap for you and shutting you up in charenton i will notify her of our proceedings to protect you against a surprise the unhappy colonel obeyed his young benefactor and went away stammering apologies he slowly went down the dark staircase lost in gloomy thoughts and crushed perhaps by the blow just dealt him the most cruel he could feel the thrust that could most deeply pierce his heart when he heard the rustle of a woman's dress on the lowest landing and his wife stood before him come monsieur said she taking his arm with a gesture like those familiar to him of old her action and the accent of her voice which had recovered its graciousness were enough to allay the colonel's wrath and he allowed himself to be led to the carriage well get in said she when the footman had let down the step and as if by magic he found himself sitting by his wife in the brougham where to asked the servant to Crolet, said she the horses started at once and carried them all across paris monsieur said the countess in a tone of voice which betrayed one of those emotions which are rare in our lives and which agitate every part of our being at such moments the heart 
fibres nerves countenance soul and body everything every pore even feels a thrill life no longer seems to be within us it flows out springs forth is communicated as if by contagion transmitted by a look a tone of voice a gesture impressing our will on others the old soldier started on hearing this single word this first terrible monsieur but still it was at once a reproach and a pardon a hope and a despair a question and an answer this word included them all none but an actress could have thrown so much eloquence so many feelings into a single word truth is less complete in its utterance it does not put everything on the outside it allows us to see what is within the colonel was filled with remorse for his suspicions his demands and his anger he looked down not to betray his agitation monsieur repeated she after an imperceptible pause i knew you at once rosine said the old soldier those words contain the only balm that can help me to forget my misfortunes two large tears rolled hot onto his wife's hands which he pressed to show his paternal affection monsieur she went on could you not have guessed what it cost me to appear before a stranger in a position so false as mine now is if i have to blush for it at least let it be in the privacy of my family ought not such a secret to remain buried in our hearts you will forgive me i hope for my apparent indifference to the woes of a chabert in whose existence i could not possibly believe i received your letters she hastily added seeing in his face the objection it expressed but they did not reach me till thirteen months after the battle of alo they were opened dirty the writing was unrecognizable and after obtaining napoleon's signature to my second marriage contract i could not help believing that some clever swindler wanted to make a fool of me therefore to avoid disturbing monsieur ferraud's peace of mind and disturbing family ties i was obliged to take precautions against a pretended chabert was i not right i ask you yes you were right it was i who was the idiot the owl the dolt not to have calculated better what the consequences of such a position might be but where are we going he asked seeing that they had reached the barrier of la chapelle to my country house near Groslay, in the valley of montmorency there monsieur we will consider the steps to be taken i know my duties though i am yours by right i am no longer yours in fact can you wish that we should become the talk of paris we need not inform the public of a situation which for me has its ridiculous side and let us preserve our dignity you still love me she said with a sad sweet gaze at the colonel but have not i been authorized to form other ties in so strange a position a secret voice bids me trust to your kindness which is so well known to me can i be wrong in taking you as the sole arbiter of my fate be at once judge and party to the suit i trust in your noble character you will be generous enough to forgive me for the consequences of faults committed in innocence i may then confess to you i love monsieur ferraud i believed that i had a right to love him i do not blush to make this confession to you even if it offends you it does not disgrace us i cannot conceal the facts when fate made me a widow i was not a mother the colonel with a wave of his hand bid his wife be silent 
and for a mile and a half they sat without speaking a single word chabert could fancy he saw the two little ones before him rosine monsieur the dead are very wrong to come to life again oh monsieur no no do not think me ungrateful only you find me a lover a mother while you left me merely a wife though it is no longer in my power to love i know how much i owe you and i can still offer you all the affection of a daughter rosine said the old man in a softened tone i no longer feel any resentment against you we will forget anything he added with one of those smiles which always reflect a noble soul i have not so little delicacy as to demand the mockery of love from a wife who no longer loves me the countess gave him a flashing look full of such deep gratitude that poor chabert would have been glad to sink again into his grave at Elo. some men have a soul strong enough for such self-devotion of which the whole reward consists in the assurance that they have made the person they love happy my dear friend we will talk all this over later when our hearts have rested said the countess the conversation turned to other subjects for it was impossible to dwell very long on this one though the couple came back again and again to their singular position either by some allusion or of serious purpose they had a delightful drive recalling the events of their former life together and the times of the empire the countess knew how to lend peculiar charm to her reminiscences and gave the conversation the tinge of melancholy that was needed to keep it serious she revived his love without awakening his desires and allowed her first husband to discern the mental wealth she had acquired while trying to accustom him to moderate his pleasure to that which a father may feel in the presence of a favorite daughter the colonel had known the countess of the empire he found her a countess of the restoration end of section four section five of colonel chabert by honore de balzac translated by clara bell and ellen marriage this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary at last by a cross-road they arrived at the entrance to a large park lying in the little valley which divides the heights of Montgency from the pretty village of Groslay. the countess had there a delightful house where the colonel on arriving found everything in readiness for his stay there as well as for his wife's misfortune is a kind of talisman whose virtue consists in its power to confirm our original nature in some men it increases their distrust and malignancy just as it improves the goodness of those who have a kind heart sorrow had made the colonel even more helpful and good than he had always been and he could understand some secrets of womanly distress which are unrevealed to most men nevertheless in spite of his loyal trustfulness he could not help saying to his wife then you felt quite sure you would bring me here yes replied she if i found colonel chabert in derville's client the appearance of truth she contrived to give to this answer dissipated the slight suspicions which the colonel was ashamed to have felt 
for three days the countess was quite charming to her first husband by tender attentions and unfailing sweetness she seemed anxious to wipe out the memory of the sufferings he had endured and to earn forgiveness for the woes which as she confessed she had innocently caused him she delighted in displaying for him the charms she knew he took pleasure in while at the same time she assumed a kind of melancholy for men are more especially accessible to certain ways certain graces of the heart or of the mind which they cannot resist she aimed at interesting him in her position and appealing to his feelings so far as to take possession of his mind and control him despotically ready for anything to attain her ends she did not yet know what she was to do with this man but at any rate she meant to annihilate him socially on the evening of the third day she felt that in spite of her efforts she could not conceal her uneasiness as to the results of her manoeuvres to give herself a minute's reprieve she went up to her room sat down before her writing-table and laid aside the mask of composure which she wore in chabert's presence like an actress who returning to her dressing-room after a fatiguing fifth act drops half dead leaving with the audience an image of herself which she no longer resembles she proceeded to finish a letter she had begun to dalbec whom she desired to go in her name and demand of derville the deeds relating to colonel chabert to copy them and to come to her at once to groslay she had hardly finished when she heard the colonel's step in the passage uneasy at her absence he had come to look for her alas she exclaimed i wish i were dead my position is intolerable why what is the matter asked the good man nothing nothing she replied she rose left the colonel and went down to speak privately to her maid whom she sent off to paris impressing on her that she was herself to deliver to delbecq the letter just written and to bring it back to the writer as soon as he had read it then the countess went out to sit on a bench sufficiently in sight for the colonel to join her as soon as he might choose the colonel who was looking for her hastened up and sat down by her rosine said he what is the matter with you she did not answer it was one of those glorious calm evenings in the month of june whose secret harmonies infuse such sweetness into the sunset the air was clear the stillness perfect so that far away in the park they could hear the voices of some children which added a kind of melody to the sublimity of the scene you do not answer me the colonel said to his wife my husband said the countess who broke off started a little and with a blush stopped to ask him what am i to say when i speak of monsieur ferraud call him your husband my poor child replied the colonel in a kind voice is he not the father of your children well then she said if he should ask what i came here for if he finds out that i came here alone with a stranger what am i to say to him listen monsieur she went on assuming a dignified attitude decide my fate i am resigned to anything my dear said the colonel taking possession of his wife's hands i have made up my mind to sacrifice myself entirely for your happiness that is impossible she exclaimed with a sudden spasmodic movement remember that you would have to renounce your identity and in an authenticated form what said the colonel is not my word enough for you the word authenticated 
fell on the old man's heart and roused involuntary distrust he looked at his wife in a way that made her colour she cast down her eyes and he feared that he might find himself compelled to despise her the countess was afraid lest she had scared the shy modesty the stern honesty of a man whose generous temper and primitive virtues were known to her though these feelings had brought the clouds to her brow they immediately recovered their harmony this was the way of it a child's cry was heard in the distance jules leave your sister in peace the countess called out what are your children here said chabert yes but i told them not to trouble you the old soldier understood the delicacy the womanly tact of so gracious a precaution and took the countess's hand to kiss it but let them come said he the little girl ran up to complain of her brother mamma mamma it was jules it was her their little hands were held out to their mother and the two childish voices mingled it was an unexpected and charming picture poor little things cried the countess no longer restraining her tears i shall have to leave them to whom will the law assign them a mother's heart cannot be divided i want them i want them are you making mamma cry said jules looking fiercely at the colonel silence jules said the mother in a decided tone the two children stood speechless examining their mother and the stranger with a curiosity which it is impossible to express in words oh yes she cried if i am separated from the count only leave me my children and i will submit to anything this was the decisive speech which gained all that she had hoped from it yes exclaimed the colonel as if he were ending a sentence already begun in his mind i must return underground again i had told myself so already can i accept such a sacrifice replied his wife if some men have died to save a mistress's honour they gave their life but once but in this case you would be giving your life every day no no it is impossible if it were only your life it would be nothing but to sign a declaration that you are not colonel chabert to acknowledge yourself an impostor to sacrifice your honour and live a lie every hour of the day human devotion cannot go so far only think no but for my poor children i would have fled with you by this time to the other end of the world but said chabert cannot i live here in your little lodge as one of your relations i am as worn out as a cracked cannon i want nothing but a little tobacco and the constitutionnel the countess melted into tears there was a contest of generosity between the comtesse ferro and colonel chabert and the soldier came out victorious this evening seeing this mother with her children the soldier was bewitched by the touching grace of a family picture in the country in the shade and the silence he made a resolution to remain dead and frightened no longer at the authentication of a deed he asked what he could do to secure beyond all risk the happiness of this family do exactly as you like said the countess i declare to you that i will have nothing to do with this affair i ought not delbecq had arrived some days before and in obedience to the countess's verbal instructions the intendant had succeeded in gaining the old soldier's confidence so on the following morning colonel chabert went with the erewhile attorney to saint leu taverny where delbecq had caused the notary to draw up an affidavit in such terms that after hearing it read 
the colonel started up and walked out of the office turf and thunder what a fool you must think me why i should make myself out a swindler he exclaimed indeed monsieur said delbecq i should advise you not to sign in haste in your place i would get at least thirty thousand francs a year out of the bargain madame would pay them after annihilating this scoundrel emeritus by the lightning look of an honest man insulted the colonel rushed off carried away by a thousand contrary emotions he was suspicious indignant and calm again by turns finally he made his way back into the park of groslay by a gap in the fence and slowly walked on to sit down and rest and meditate at his ease in a little room under a gazebo from which the road to saint leu could be seen the path being strewn with the yellowish sand which is used instead of river gravel the countess who was sitting in the upper room of this little summer-house did not hear the colonel's approach for she was too much preoccupied with the success of her business to pay the smallest attention to the slight noise made by her husband nor did the old man notice that his wife was in the room over him well monsieur delbecq has he signed the countess asked her secretary whom she saw alone on the road beyond the hedge of a ha-ha no madame i do not even know what has become of our man the old horse reared then we shall be obliged to put him into charenton said she since we have got him the colonel who recovered the elasticity of youth to leap the ha-ha in the twinkling of an eye was standing in front of delbecq on whom he bestowed the two finest slaps that ever a scoundrel's cheeks received and you may add that old horses can kick said he his rage spent the colonel no longer felt vigorous enough to leap the ditch he had seen the truth in all its nakedness the countess's speech and delbecq's reply had revealed the conspiracy of which he was to be the victim the care taken of him was but a bait to entrap him in a snare that speech was like a drop of subtle poison bringing on in the old soldier a return of all his sufferings physical and moral he came back to the summer-house through the park gate walking slowly like a broken man then for him there was to be neither peace nor truce from this moment he must begin the odious warfare with this woman of which derville had spoken enter on a life of litigation feed on gall drink every morning of the cup of bitterness and then fearful thought where was he to find the money needful to pay the cost of the first proceedings he felt such disgust of life that if there had been any water at hand he would have thrown himself into it that if he had had a pistol he would have blown out his brains then he relapsed into the indecision of mind which since his conversation with derville at the dairyman's had changed his character at last having reached the kiosk he went up to the gazebo where little rose windows afforded a view over each lovely landscape of the valley and where he found his wife seated on a chair the countess was gazing at the distance and preserved a calm countenance showing that impenetrable face which women can assume when resolved to do their worst she wiped her eyes as if she had been weeping and played absently with the pink ribbons of her sash nevertheless in spite of her apparent assurance she could not help shuddering slightly when she saw before her her venerable benefactor standing with folded arms his face pale his brow stern madame he said after gazing at her fixedly for a moment and compelling her to blush madame i do not curse you i scorn you 
i can now thank the chance that has divided us i do not feel even a desire for revenge i no longer love you i want nothing from you live in peace on the strength of my word it is worth more than the scrawl of all the notaries in paris i will never assert my claim to the name i perhaps have made illustrious i am henceforth but a poor devil named hyacinth who asks no more than his share of the sunshine farewell the countess threw herself at his feet she would have detained him by taking his hands but he pushed her away with disgust saying do not touch me the countess's expression when she heard her husband's retreating steps is quite indescribable then with the deep perspicacity given only by utter villainy or by fierce worldly selfishness she knew that she might live in peace on the word and the contempt of this loyal veteran chabert in fact disappeared the dairyman failed in business and became a hackney cab driver the colonel perhaps took up some similar industry for a time perhaps like a stone flung into a chasm he went falling from ledge to ledge to be lost in the mire of rags that seethes through the streets of paris six months after this event derville hearing no more of colonel chabert or the comtesse ferraud supposed that they had no doubt come to a compromise which the countess out of revenge had had arranged by some other lawyer so one morning he added up the sums he had advanced to the said chabert with the costs and begged the comtesse ferraud to claim from monsieur comte chabert the amount of the bill assuming that she would know where to find her first husband the very next day comte ferraud's man of business lately appointed president of the county court in a town of some importance wrote this distressing note to derville monsieur madame la comtesse ferraud desires me to inform you that your client took complete advantage of your confidence and that the individual calling himself comte chabert has acknowledged that he came forward under false pretences yours etc delbecq one comes across people who are on my honour too stupid by half cried derville they don't deserve to be christians be humane generous philanthropical and a lawyer and you are bound to be cheated there is a piece of business that will cost me two thousand franc notes some time after receiving this letter derville went to the palais de justice in search of a pleader to whom he wished to speak and who was employed in the police court as chance would have it derville went into court number six at the moment when the presiding magistrate was sentencing one hyacinth to two months imprisonment as a vagabond and subsequently to be taken to the mendicity house of detention a sentence which by magistrate's law is equivalent to perpetual imprisonment on hearing the name of hyacinth derville looked at the delinquent sitting between two gendarmes on the bench for the accused and recognized in the condemned man his false colonel chabert the old soldier was placid motionless almost absent-minded in spite of his rags in spite of the misery stamped on his countenance it gave evidence of noble pride his eye had a stoical expression which no magistrate ought to have misunderstood but as soon as a man has fallen into the hands of justice he is no more than a moral entity a matter of law or of fact just as to statists he has become a zero when the veteran was taken back to the lock-up to be removed later with the batch of vagabonds at that moment at the bar 
derville availed himself of the privilege accorded to lawyers of going wherever they please in the courts and followed him to the lock-up where he stood scrutinizing him for some minutes as well as the curious crew of beggars among whom he found himself the passage to the lock-up at that moment afforded one of those spectacles which unfortunately neither legislators nor philanthropists nor painters nor writers come to study like all the laboratories of the law this anteroom is a dark and malodorous place along the walls runs a wooden seat blackened by the constant presence there of the wretches who come to this meeting-place of every form of social squalor where not one of them is missing a poet might say that the day was ashamed to light up this dreadful sewer through which so much misery flows there is not a spot on that plank where some crime has not sat in embryo or matured not a corner where a man has never stood who driven to despair by the blight which justice has set upon him after his first fault has not there begun a career at the end of which looms the guillotine or the pistol snap of the suicide all who fall on the pavement of paris rebound against these yellow gray walls on which a philanthropist who was not a speculator might read a justification of the numerous suicides complained of by hypocritical writers who are incapable of taking a step to prevent them for that justification is written in that anteroom like a preface to the dramas of the morgue or to those enacted on the place de la greve at this moment colonel chabert was sitting among these men men with coarse faces clothed in the horrible livery of misery and silent at intervals or talking in a low tone for three gendarmes on duty paced to and fro their sabres clattering on the floor do you recognize me said derville to the old man standing in front of him yes sir said chabert rising if you are an honest man derville went on in an undertone how could you remain in my debt the old soldier blushed as a young girl might when accused by her mother of a clandestine love affair what madame ferraud has not paid you cried he in a loud voice paid me said derville she wrote to me that you were a swindler the colonel cast up his eyes in a sublime impulse of horror and imprecation as if to call heaven to witness to this fresh subterfuge monsieur said he in a voice that was calm by sheer huskiness get the gendarme to allow me to go into the lock-up and i will sign an order which will certainly be honoured at a word from derville to the sergeant he was allowed to take his client into the room where hyacinthe wrote a few lines and addressed them to the comtesse ferraud send her that said the soldier and you will be paid your costs and the money you advanced believe me monsieur if i have not shown you the gratitude i owe you for your kind offices it is not the less there and he laid his hand on his heart yes it is there deep and sincere but what can the unfortunate do they live and that is all what said derville did you not stipulate for an allowance do not speak of it cried the old man you cannot conceive how deep my contempt is for the outside life to which most men cling i was suddenly attacked by a sickness disgust of humanity when i think that napoleon is at st helena everything on earth is a matter of indifference to me i can no longer be a soldier that is my only real grief after all he added with a gesture of childish simplicity it is better to enjoy luxury of feeling 
than of dress for my part i fear nobody's contempt and the colonel sat down on his bench again derville went away on returning to his office he sent godeschal at that time his second clerk to the comtesse ferro who on reading the note at once paid the sum due to comte chabert's lawyer in eighteen forty towards the end of june godeschal now himself an attorney went to ruisse with derville to whom he had succeeded when they reached the avenue leading from the high road to bicetre they saw under one of the elm trees by the wayside one of those old broken and hoary paupers who have earned the marshal's staff among beggars by living on at bicetre as poor women live on at la salpetriere this man one of the two thousand poor creatures who are lodged in the infirmary for the aged was seated on a corner-stone and seemed to have concentrated all his intelligence on an operation well known to these pensioners which consists in drying their snuffy pocket-handkerchiefs in the sun perhaps to save washing them the old man had an attractive countenance he was dressed in a reddish cloth wrapper coat which the workhouse affords to its inmates a sort of horrible livery i say derville said godeschal to his travelling companion look at that old fellow isn't he like those grotesque carved figures we get from germany and it is alive perhaps it is happy derville looked at the poor man through his eyeglass and with a little exclamation of surprise he said that old man my dear fellow is a whole poem or as the romantics say a drama did you ever meet the comtesse ferraud yes she is a clever woman and agreeable but rather too pious said godeschal that old bicetre pauper is her lawful husband comte chabert the old colonel she has had him sent here no doubt and if he is in this workhouse instead of living in a mansion it is solely because he reminded the pretty countess that he had taken her like a hackney cab on the street i can remember now the tiger's glare she shot at him at that moment this opening having excited godeschal's curiosity derville related the story here told two days later on monday morning as they returned to paris the two friends looked again at bicetre and derville proposed that they should call on colonel chabert halfway up the avenue they found the old man sitting on the trunk of a felled tree with his stick in one hand he was amusing himself with drawing lines in the sand on looking at him narrowly they perceived that he had been breakfasting elsewhere than at bicetre good morning colonel chabert said derville not chabert not chabert my name is hyacinthe replied the veteran i am no longer a man i am number one six four room seven he added looking at derville with timid anxiety the fear of an old man and a child are you going to visit the man condemned to death he asked after a moment's silence he is not married he is very lucky poor fellow said godeschal would you like something to buy snuff with all the simplicity of a street arab the colonel eagerly held out his hand to the two strangers who each gave him a twenty-franc piece he thanked them with a puzzled look saying brave troopers he ported arms pretended to take aim at them and shouted with a smile fire both arms vive napoleon and he drew a flourish in the air with his stick the nature of his wound has no doubt made him childish said derville childish he 
said another old pauper who was looking on why there are days when you had better not tread on his corns he is an old rogue full of philosophy and imagination but to-day what can you expect he has had his monday treat he was here monsieur so long ago as eighteen twenty at that time a prussian officer whose chaise was crawling up the hill of villejuif came by on foot we two were together hyacinthe and i by the roadside the officer as he walked was talking to another a russian or some animal of the same species and when the prussian saw the old boy just to make fun he said to him here is an old cavalryman who must have been at rossbach i was too young to be there said hyacinthe but i was at jena and the prussian made off pretty quick without asking any more questions what a destiny exclaimed derville taken out of the foundling hospital to die in the infirmary for the aged after helping napoleon between whiles to conquer egypt and europe do you know my dear fellow derville went on after a pause there are in modern society three men who can never think well of the world the priest the doctor and the man of law and they wear black robes perhaps because they are in mourning for every virtue and every illusion the most hapless of the three is the lawyer when a man comes in search of the priest he is prompted by repentance by remorse by beliefs which make him interesting which elevate him and comfort the soul of the intercessor whose task will bring him a sort of gladness he purifies repairs and reconciles but we lawyers we see the same evil feelings repeated again and again nothing can correct them our offices are sewers which can never be cleansed how many things have i learned in the exercise of my profession i have seen a father die in a garret deserted by two daughters to whom he had given forty thousand francs a year i have known wills burned i have seen mothers robbing their children wives killing their husbands and working on the love they could inspire to make the men idiotic or mad that they might live in peace with a lover i have seen women teaching the child of their marriage such tastes as must bring it to the grave in order to benefit the child of an illicit affection i could not tell you all i have seen for i have seen crimes against which justice is impotent in short all the horrors that romancers suppose they have invented are still below the truth you will know something of these pretty things as for me i am going to live in the country with my wife i have a horror of paris i have seen plenty of them already in desroches office replied godeschal end of section five end of colonel chabert by honore de balzac translated by clara bell and ellen marriage